concept that the Moors just did not bring. This is a European concept. And what we've got to begin to do is look at the realities of what we're facing. Um, the origins of the word Moor. Just let me give you some examples of the, of the word Moor. There was a brother, or a gentleman, by the name of Richard Haklut. He was a traveler in the 1400s, who he reported that in the old times, the people of Africa were called Ethiops or Moors, or Moorins, which means that the word Moor was used for anybody of dark complexion, like Ethiop means land of burnt faces. Moors meant black. In Spanish, mora is blackberry. Moreno is dark complexion. Moreno also means sweetheart. Mira morena. You know, when you say morena in Spanish, sometimes that means sweetheart. Sometimes you say even negrita. That's sweetheart. Why? Because the African woman was the sweetheart of the nation. That is the woman who was held up. Just like we hold up the European woman, the blonde, the skinny, all that stuff that we say is the model. In Africa, it was the African woman who was that model of what all perfection was. In French, moricard means dark skin. Morillon means black grape. In Italian, mora means negro or Moorish female. Mora also means blackberry, which when you go to Spanish, mora means blackberry. And then you have moreola, M-O-R-A-I-O-L-A, which means a black olive. So you have the derivation of the word more, so they can't get out of the concept of what the word meant. The word means black. You cannot put other people's faces up here, you know, and say that they were light complexion Ethiopians. Ethiopian mean black face. So if you say light complexion Ethiopian, you're talking about a light complexion burnt face. <laughs> but you see, when you're speaking English, English says that you can say what you want to because you, de you control people's minds. So if you say it, it is. Like amen. Amen. We say amen means so be it. Amen does not mean so be it. Amen could never mean so be it in the Latin language. Amen means hidden waters that the Chemites gave to the Christian church that Latin, in Latin, they just said, Amen means so be it. So be it is a sentence. If you turn that around, so be it, you say it be so. It being the object or the subject, be is the verb and so is the adverb. Nowhere in the Latin language do you have the derivation of Amen. But you do have it in Kemet. So the language, obviously, I mean, they take words and say, this is what it means, and then it's accepted under those conditions. Every day, the Webster's Dictionary is being expanded. Every day is being expanded. It's just adding new words. Oh, that sounds good. Put it in there. And people who make these decisions, if they say ain't is good English, ain't becomes good English. <laughs> Why? They said is, not is. is so. Who said is, so is? They said it. And because they said it, and because they have control over people's minds, it be so. But it don't have to be so. And once you say it's not so, it is not so. And that's power. And that's where we are in need of, is just defining ourselves as a people. We want to look at the early Moors. The early Moors, of course, again, looking at Sheikh Anta Diop's model, we know that if in life originating in this area of the world, Africans moved along the Happy Valley or the Nile Valley, going north, and they branched over going west. So as they traveled north, certain branches of African folk coming through the Happy Valley also branch off west. Mm -hmm. This is in Sheikh Anta Diop's uh, uh, work, Black Africa. Just as they traveled north, they also traveled south and created the kingdoms of South Africa, the Monomotapa that would later become Monomotapa and the other civilizations of South Africa. They then would also island hop into Australia and New Zealand. Okay, Zena, <laughs> I'm sorry to say this, but Zena is not a New Ze Zealand. She's a European. Yeah, and it's very important. New Zealand is an African island. Tasmania is an African island. Australia is an African island. All of these areas are African islands, but when they've been around long enough, they can tell you and make you believe that they've been around a long time. Just like when you look at North Africa, I've seen a program where the woman of light complexion was talking about the builders of the pyramids probably looked like her. I can tell you biologically why they couldn't have looked like her. Because when you dress a certain way, and in all of the freezes that we see, we see people that are lightly dressed. If you are a light complexion and you stand in 110 degrees in the shade, you're going to get skin cancer. So you could not have been looking like that and been out in the sun without anything on. So you can't look like that because you would have died. Simple scientific principle. It had no emotion in this at all. I'm not wishing no harm on you. I'm just saying, let's look at this. Biologically, you cannot last in the, in the sun for thousands of years 
and build pyramids. You can't do that. You die on top of the pyramid. It can't be done. You know? Say, yeah, exactly. You see? These are principles of science that once we get these down and we, and it becomes grounded, then we sit and we start laughing at them. And if there's one thing Europeans don't like, they don't like to be laughed at. They don't mind you laughing with them as long as they're telling the joke. As long as they're not the joke. But I have to tell you, they are the joke. They're a very sad joke because by now I'd be embarrassed to keep telling the same stories that they're telling. And actually believe it, you know. My mother used to say, you know, you're telling this story so convincingly I could almost believe you know what you're talking about. <laughs> this is how I feel about them. They, they play a good game. But you, as Dr. Clark informed Mary Lefkowitz on the tape that you've seen, you can only have a debate when, some, when there are two opinions. There are not two opinions here. There's only one, and the other is a, a fear of what that opinion really is. <laughs> you see? So there's no argument here. But we as an African people have to ground ourselves in this and understand where the argument is and where it is not. My mama used to say, don't sweat the small change. And right now they are small change. Because even if they gave us everything we asked for, are we as a nation ready to do what we have to do in terms of assuming control? We need to understand nation building. And looking at the Moors helps us understand this. And this is why I'm looking at the Moors. And that's why I've gone from the comedic origin of the universe to the Dogon philosophy to the Moors. Because there's been a natural transgression in my studies to bring me to this level to be able to talk to you about all of the formation. Because I can take you right back to the Chemites utilizing the Moors. So it's important that we see this connection. It's important to understand that there were, these early African people can be broken up into different nations. But all people are one people. Don't lose sight of that. There's only one people on this planet. And because of climate, we differentiate ourselves phenotypically or morphologically. That's what happens to the human family. It's the same thing when you take an animal. You can take an animal in one condition, take them to another condition, and that animal, if it survives in its environment, will mutate itself according to its climate. If you, if we teach this to our children in evolution classes. In sixth grade, we have books that teach what's called mutation. Mutation says that if you have a faded plant, that's called an albino plant. If you have a peacock without its colors, that's an albino peacock. If you have a cockroach, a white cockroach, that's an albino cockroach. But see, they stop there. They only deal with animals and plants because they know if they took it to the human level, they would have to make the mutation a European. So they stop in the plants and animals because they understand in, in continuing the story of organic life, that that which mutated itself from the human being became the European. And just like all other things, we are not the endangered species, by the way. We are endangered because humans are hunting us. The European is endangered because the sun is hunting them. And it's important to understand that by the year 3000, now I'm being nice because I'm a cosmic being, and I know I'm going to be around in another thousand years. I may not look like this, but I'm going to come back in another thousand years. So I know I'm here. And as an African being, you will never die. Not only will you never die, but you've been not only here a couple of times, but you've touched other galaxies a couple of times also. And as African people, when we were aware of ourselves and what we were able to do through our melanic state, we knew what galaxies we could tap into. It is my belief, and I'm going to end up with this as we go through this presentation. I believe that there were Africans who, daily, who, be, who dared to go where no others went before. I believe Africans left this planet in ships and have been going through all the galaxies. And I'm going to explain that to you when we break down types of civilizations and how you draw your energy source and how we as an African people, like the brother said, we can get all this information we want to get all culturally beside ourselves. But if we don't have the power to do something economically, and after you get the economics together, because rem remember, we had the culture and we had the economics. We got to get the military piece together. You see, because you may have all the money you want, all the culture you want, but if they got the big guns, you know, it's like when you're on that boat, you know? And that man on the end is, is very haughty and proud. He says, I got the lifeboat. But that old dingy man on the end says, I got the gun, give up that boat. You see, it don't make a difference what you have. If someone can take it from you, then you might as well not have it. So as a nation, we have to start thinking of very serious things, things that make people very nervous. But we have to do it in a way that I'm not going to whisper it anymore. 
I really don't think there's a need to whisper. And I think that when we whisper, we're telling our children, 